As the original meter test switch manufacturer, Tesco is your trusted source for meter test switches. From the first patent in 1920 to today, Tesco's test switches are designed to combine the best features of tried and proven switching methods with improvements in materials and construction. With the shortest lead times in the industry and the ability to custom manufacture to your specifications, let Tesco fulfill your next order for test switches. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Tesco Tuesday. Can everybody hear me out there? Yep. All right, John. Um, and this is a special edition of Tesco Tuesday because it is Fat Tuesday or here mm. in uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Dutch tradition is Fastnacht Day where you use up all your butter and eggs and bread and all that before. And usually you get donuts, but no one brought us donuts into the office today. So I'm a little disappointed at that, but to uh, everyone else and happy Tuesday and uh, happy Fat Tuesday. And uh, we'll get started shortly here on transformer and self-contained meter box safety. We're gonna talk about test switches and hot sockets. And um, just to get started here every week, I'm sure you guys are sick of me saying this, but just to remind any of the newcomers, um, we are going to, um, everybody comes on muted. So we do that so we can hear everybody. If you're not, please mute yourself. If you have a question, you can always unmute, but be sure to go ahead and mute yourself afterward. Um, and we also have the little chat box feature down. It should be to your bottom right on the screen and you can always pop a question in there. We'll try to address it during the, um, slide presentation and we'll have a Q&A afterward as well and you can always um, email us afterward or give us a call if you have any questions we'll put that information into the chat and um, we can always find our presentations online afterward we also email that out to you if you signed up for our, um, our email blasts and all you can get those sent to you as well and um, you can get copies of the presentation anything that way so with that, John, I will throw it over to you to get started. And we'll also have Tom joining us a little bit later and um, we'll go from there. So go ahead, John. Sounds great. You can hear me okay, Andy? Absolutely, yeah. Excellent. Hey, everybody, how are you? Uh, thank you for taking some time with us this morning. As Andy said, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, box safety, meter box safety, both on the transformer rated side and on the self-contained side. So we're gonna start on the transformer rated side. Um, in particular, we're talking about test switches and safety of test switches, how to use test switches, um, you know, specifications on test switches, all that good stuff. Um, and then we'll switch over to the uh, self-contained side where we'll talk about safety with hot socket conditions and Tom will talk about that side of it. Um, so just to start, we've been manufacturing test switches for over 100 years. The knife blade test switch is not a new design. It's a simple knife blade, right? It's a pretty fail safe device. Uh, Tesco invented the very first test switch um, over 100 years ago, actually. So we've been doing this for a very long time. Um, but, it, but as I said, it's just a very, very fail safe device. These things just don't fail. It's you know, why change it? This industry is not quick to change things anyhow, as most of you know, but this really works well. It's inherently safe and, and they just do the job they should do. So on the test switch side, we'll talk a little bit about using test switches, and then we'll get into a little bit about um, meter test switch specifications. We'll talk about different test switch configurations that you guys may see out there. Um, and then we'll talk about accessories that you may use with test switches, and we'll finish up this section of it um, talking a little bit just about pre-wired boxes and some things that you may see there before we flip it over to the self-contained side, okay? So that said, you know, the, the main reason for using a test switch in a transformer rated service is so that you can interact with either the meter or the CT for testing, for change out, no matter what it is, so that you can do it safely without disrupting what we call the CT loop. So what I'm showing here, this is what you may see in a typical 9S service, right? It's 405 CTs. Um, it's a little bit upside down as to what you would typically say it, right? So, but, you know, the, the bottom line is here, if you look at your C phase, the, you know, current comes from the service through the secondary side of the CT, through your test switch, over to your meter, back out of your meter and back up through your test switch. And that's that loop. That's that CT loop that we talk about, that constant loop. And you never want to disrupt that loop and have a shorted secondary because what happens is voltage will continue to build up on the primary side and it's got no place to go. Okay, so it'll become a dangerous situation. So if you look at this, I don't know if any of you have ever seen anything that looked similar to this out in the field or come across anything like this. 
Um, obviously not a good situation here. There was obviously some sort of a fire. Um, looking at this, possibly even an explosion. And, you know, the important thing on the safety side is right here, you know, the secondary loop of a current transformer must never be open when service current is present in the primary. When there's current in the primary and the secondary of a current transformer is open circuited, the voltage across the secondary can rise to hundreds and even thousands of volts, creating an extremely dangerous situation, right? So, you know, the first hazard for this obviously is electrical shock to the testing personnel, um, but the second hazard is breakdown of the current transformer installation, which you see here happened and caused a fire and can often lead to an explosion as well. So that could be extremely scary and extremely dangerous. So this is why you wanna make sure that you're using a test switch safely so that you don't ever end up with this open secondary situation, okay? So when you're using a test switch, I wanted to just give you a couple of scenarios here. So the connections that you see right here are what we would typically see if we were connecting up to do what we call a customer load test. Customer load test out in the field is, you know, so if you're testing your meter and you wanna test that meter using the load that is currently on the building at that time, all we're going to do is, and these connections right here are shown are uh, coming off of our Tesco 6330 site analyzer kit. Sorry for the shameless plug there, but it really is a great device for site analyzing. Um, but this, that unit will test both the CTs, do burden, ratio, and admittance, as well as do uh, meter accuracy testing. So in this situation, we're doing a meter accuracy test using the customer load, okay? So we're using our duckbill probes here, and we'll talk a little bit later about the duckbill probes. Um, but you can see it's really important that all the probes are facing up on the same side. And if you look at this particular test switch, we've got our voltages on one side of the switch, you see the red, yellow, and blue, that's our three voltages, A phase, B phase, and C phase. We have a neutral position here in the fourth slot, and then we have our current pairs. Currents on a test switch are always in pairs. That's why you see six typically on a 9S service. You may see less on a different service. So, you know, here's your A phase current pair to the left in red, here's your B phase and your C phase. So we have our voltage connections from the test kit just connected to the service voltage that's coming into the box here, right? So that's what's powering up the test kit. But now I can take my duckbill plugs and plug them into the test switch. And all I've done at this point was I've just put my field test kit into that CT loop without disrupting that CT loop at all. So what's happening now is, you know, that loop that we talked about, current is now coming up through the service, and this is a, a test stand, so you don't see you know, wires coming in through the bottom of the service here. This is connected to a test board, actually. Um, the current, you know, wires will be coming up through the service, and, you know, that current is coming off the CT, coming up through this side of the switch, up into the meter, but what's happening is it's going into our ductile probe, out into the test kit, back out of the test kit, and then up to the meter, and then back down through this side, back to the CT. And again, it just continuously makes that loop. But now inside of that loop is our field test kit. Now when we go to run our meter test, we're just going to recognize the field test kit will pick up the customer uh, current that's coming off of this meter. It will take the amount of energy that the meter saw and the field test kit now sees that same amount of energy and it just does a comparison. Hey, here's the amount of energy that the meter saw versus here is the amount of energy that our calibrated reference standard in our field test kit saw. So that's how we would do a customer load test interacting with the test switch. So what we did here again, as you can see, we did not disrupt that current loop. And that, that's the key here is not disrupting the current loop. All right, now this one here shows a fan. Hey John, I have test. a, yes. can I ask you a quick question? I got a question that just came into me here. Um, they're asking what type of equipment cable terminations are best when interfacing with a test switch? Ah, great question. Yeah, so um, typically you'll see alligator clips out there, right? Often you'll see alligator clips. Whenever you're, you're going into the test jack, test switches are designed, I, you guys can see this, with these test jacks on them. It's what we call the test jack switch so that you can insert a duck bill. So, so that's a must. You have to have duck bills, especially if you want to interact with your CTs to do CT testing. Um, that's the, the, definitely the safest method of doing that. And they're designed specifically for test switches. Um, alligator clips, you see all the time, whenever you are you know, just picking up voltages or picking up um, 
currents. On the other side, you know, if we use a simple load box, we may just use, you know, regular alligator clips that you would see. But I have recently fallen in love with what we call these easy hook connections here. I don't know if any of you guys have ever used these, but I would strongly recommend these. These work really well on your test switch. I'll show you in a little bit. You have these uh, wire tabs. I don't know if you guys can see them, but they have holes in them. And you can actually connect those easy hooks. They're spring loaded. They're super safe. You just push them. They're, they're easy to get to with your gloves. I find them very simple to use. And you just hook them on. And that's what we're showing here in this picture. So those work really well. But the alligator clips you can still always use. But I like these smaller alligator clips here. I, I've always seen the larger, wider alligator clips. But these thinner, more needle nose type alligator clips are much better, much safer. These are really, really protected. Um, and it just gives you a little bit more room, right? Because you're out there in the field. You may be at a 480 service. You have your leathers, your gloves on, right? So it can be difficult to get to. So I like the needle nose alligator clips and the easy hooks. So hopefully that answered the question there, whoever that was. Um, so in, in, this, in this setup right here, you can see it's essentially the same as what we had before. We had our voltages all connected to the same, same place and our neutral connected. Our duck bills are still in this, into our test jacks. But now what we've done is we've opened up what we call the current return switches. And that's this switch right here with the red handle, the yellow handle right here, and the blue handle. I don't know if you can notice in the last one, we kept those closed because we wanted to take the current from the meter into the load box. In this setup here, the phantom load test, we're going to generate the load in the field test kit. So that load is going to come from our field test kit through this easy hook onto the meter, back out, back down through the duck bill, into our test kit, back out. And then this guy right here comes up to our current return on the top because he's out of the other side. So these are on opposite sides. This is on the test jack side, and this hook is on the current return side. So when I open up this uh, return, all I've done now, the CT loop, I've just kind of taken the meter out of that CT loop so that I can apply a phantom load to the meter and I'm not you know, pushing load back through the CT loop, if that makes sense for everybody. Okay, any questions on that? I think we're all good, right. John. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about ANSI C12 definitions because everything we do as a test switch manufacturer is determined and dictated essentially by, you know, ANSI C12.9. Um, so we can talk a little bit about uh, test switch materials. All test switches are essentially made, all the metal components that you see, it's full hard copper is what it is. And then you'll see some bronze in there. Um, and then everything else is plastic in the test switch. Everything else is just a, you know, high voltage rated plastic. Um, plating is something that you see and there, there's, <laughs> there's always a back and forth about Plating this particular switch right here, you can see it has this silver tone to it. Um, this is what we call bright tin plating. Um, this is the standard for plating these days for test switches. You can see in the two pictures here. Um, this one shows a test switch that has bright tin plating. And this one here on the right is um, just plain bare copper. Is one better than the other? Uh, depends on who you talk to. Quite, that's the honest answer there. Um, I don't typically see tests which is corrode. Um, these things last a long time. Where we do occasionally see test switch corrosion is out in oil fields. For whatever reason, in an oil field, it really tends to prematurely corrode and cause oxidation on bare copper for whatever reason in oil fields. But I mean, I have customers who buy test switches from us in Florida and test switches who buy or customers who buy test switches from us in Seattle, let's say. And the guys in Florida, I don't know if there's anybody on the line from Florida, from a Florida power line or anybody, you know, a lot of those guys, they wouldn't dare buy a test switch with plating on it because many, many years ago, there was a manufacturer and they had a plating instant uh, issue where the plating actually flaked off and plating processes were different then. Bright tin does not flake. And that's the beauty of using bright tin plating. It does not flake. Um, there are other plating materials you can use. You can use nickel as well, which is really, really nice. I don't know if you've ever seen a nickel plated test switch. It's super shiny, looks great. Very, very smooth actuation on the test switch, um, but it's expensive. That's the downside. It's really expensive. Bright tin does a really good job. Again, it doesn't flake. 
But because at some point there was an issue with flaking, you know, 60, 70 years ago, you know, that utility decided, no, we are definitely not going to use plating on our test switches. They don't corrode anyhow. There's no sense in it. But I have customers in Seattle wouldn't dare buy an unplated test switch. They feel, oh, no, it's got to be plated because we're worried about, you know, premature oxidation up here. And it's essentially the same environment, right? It's that moist, salt air, wet environment. So it really just is a matter of what that utility has been doing for a while. So, you know, if you work at one utility and you see switches that are, you know, silverish in color, and then you go to another and it looks like bare copper, um, most likely it's just because that's what that utility has always been doing and there hasn't been any impetus to make that change. Okay. And we had a comment on the chat here, John, from Christian. Here on the North Carolina coast, we have a lot of corrosion with tin. Copper mm -hmm. still corrodes, but not as bad if we use dielectric di grease. Is yep. that a thing? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So great point. Great point. You do want to be a little careful with, you know, and Tom will probably talk a little bit about this in a hot sockets discussion, actually. When you're, when you're using, you know, greases and things of that nature, any kind of lubricants and, and things to help fight against corrosion and even to make the test switch actuate smoother. You know, you just have to be aware whenever you put something like that onto, you know, a surface, at some point it's going to dry out and it becomes this goopy, bluey stuff at some point, right? So just something to be aware of. There is like dry molly and things like that. I think you can use um, that don't do that so much, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. That could also help corrosion if you are worried about corrosion. Um, but I, we don't typically see the bright tin um, test, which is, you know, corrode that much. But yeah, in certain situations, you may very well, very well see, see a little bit of oxidation there for sure. But the bright tin will definitely help that versus the um, plating. But good point. Thank you. Um, the other thing is your wiring connections. So, you know, I mentioned before I showed in the last picture how, you know, we have these wire pads so that you can hook your easy hooks on too. And these, I don't know if you can tell, it's just, you know, wire nuts that go down. Um, you know, typically when we sell these test switches, they come in, you know, without the tabs on. The customer doesn't want us to put the tabs on there because they have to make their wiring connections on there. You want to make really certain that when you make your wiring connections, that they are good and tight. Check every single one because that will make a difference in your CT performance. Because if you have loose connections, you will tend to build up burden, which is going to, you know, mean that you're going to start metering inaccurately because your CTs aren't performing as well as they can because you have bad connections coming into your test switches. Um, they're also what we call, we call them box connectors. Essentially, they're compression lugs. I don't know if you can see it here in this particular switch. I have some here. It's basically just a compression screw, a little bit simpler method of locking down your wire. It's a you know flat screwdriver versus having to use a nut driver of some sort. Um, but you do want to make sure that those wire connections are you know good and tight. Look down after you make those wire connections, take a look, make sure everything's straight, everything's good and tight. When you're, if you guys are, you know, purchasing, you know, test switches from, you know, an outside manufacturer, you know, some things you want to check. You want to make sure that, you know, when you look down a test switch this way, open the box. When you look at it down there, make sure everything is straight. You want it to be lined up. You don't want things loose. Take a quick look, make sure everything makes sense. Is it, you know, what it should be? Make sure things are tight. You hear snaps, you know, when I put a test plug into a test switch, and I don't know if you guys can hear this or not, but you should hear that snap. I don't know if you guys can hear that through my headphones, um, but you want, you want to make sure that you have good tight connections all across your test switch. That's really, really important. Okay. And then covers, you know, some people like to use the covers. It's, you know, a 50, 50 thing. It is another thing you have to take off. You know, you see the picture here of the clear cover. Um, we manufacture covers, you know, that have captive hardware on them, which is really nice. So you're not losing wing nuts and things like that. Um, but you can get covers in full black. Some people don't like them opaque so that you can't see through them. They like them just black. Um, and you can see we have this notch here and that's so that your wires can come out. Other folks don't want that notch. They want to take the wires and bend them down and out and around. So it really is just a matter of utility preference. I wouldn't say that you know, one way is better than another, or one cover is better than another. I mean, you know, adding the covers does help to keep dust and debris out of there. Um, but just another thing you have to take off when you go into the box. So it's really a matter of utility preference. Hey, John. Yes. Okay. I have another question from my new friend, uh, Raphael. I have found some plating that comes off with alligator clips. Will this happen to on the Tesco runs? So I have not seen plating come off bright tin plating. 
from off of a Tesco test switch with alligator clips. Now, that said, you know, obviously, if the test switch has been out there since the 1960s, right, or 70s, which is very, very popular, who knows what stress that's been under, right? So how many times have alligator, switch, alligator clips been on there and taken and on and off? And, you know, if you if you score, the beauty of the bright tin plating is that it, it it doesn't, it's it's not really a safety issue where it's going to flake and cause a short somewhere. Bright tin plating sort of just would wear off, right? So even if you do see a little bit, of, no different than your meters, your meters stabs have bright tin plating. It's the same exact thing. It's copper, hard, full hard copper with bright tin plating. And you'll see those after being pulled in and out a few times, you'll see that that um, the bright tin plating just starts to wear. So it doesn't really flake and cause a dangerous situation. So if I saw that, I wouldn't be super concerned. I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, untypical if you did have, you know, especially really strong, tight alligator clips on and off of there over the years, Raphael. So hope that answered your question somewhat. Hey, John, one, yes. one other thing about the cover. The covers on a test switch are designed so that if you put the cover back on, you can never leave a test switch in the open position. Yeah, great point. Great right, point. because if you if you walk away after testing the meter and it does happen, it has happened, probably not at your utilities, but maybe at a neighboring mm -hmm. one. Um, at some point, somebody left the test switch open. And what that means is you're not measuring any energy with that meter. Um, yeah. So <laughs> it's a bad thing. Give it away so some free power. <laughs> not only is the cover um, a, a safety uh, item, mm -hmm. but it is also a revenue. Does force you close the switch. Yep. All right. As once you put it on and tighten it in place, your switches cannot be in the open position. They are designed that way. Yep. Yep. Now it's a great point, Tom. It's a great point. The other thing is too to that is, and I don't know if you can see it here, but the the cover mounts actually have little holes in the top that you can run a wire seal through. So again, it's just another security measure as well. You know, you have your security seal on the outside of the box, but if you put a cover on your test switch. You can also seal those, you know, with a wire seal or whatever it is you want to do. Just another measure, just so you want to make absolutely certain that nobody's getting in there and playing around with any, everything. So, but no, good point. Good point. So, all this stuff is kind of defined by ANSI, right? So, everything that we do as test switch manufacturers, we do to the ANSI specs, right? So, ANSI gives us all these definitions about, you know, what's the test jack, you know, the test jack switch, you know, those are the ones where we actually insert our duct bills into. Um, you know, test plugs, it talks about test plugs, and we're going to talk a little bit more about these. Um, talks about the current ratings, 20 amp minimum, you know, voltage rating, 300 V to 600 V. So it, it defines all this great stuff for us. And then you can see the other thing that it does is it talks about the, you know, the, the sizing of your test switches. So, you know, it's really important for you guys to understand, you know, there, there are several test switch manufacturers out there. There, you know, you've got us, you've got Milbank, Brooks, Dormy, you know, there's, there's a few of us out there for sure. But it's really, really important for you guys that, you know, if you pull out a Milbank test switch because, you know, something got damaged on it, that you can replace that with a, you know, Brooks switch or a Tesco switch or whatever it may be. So ANSI kind of, you know, lays out these definitions for us that, you know, hey, listen, your poles, all of your poles need to be on the same center to center distance, regardless of, you know, what manufacturer you are. If you're building test switches, your poles need to be on the same center to center distance. Your bases, your mounting holes for your bases, if it's a 10 pole base, they all need to be the same. It's if it's a four pole base, all those four pole bases need to be the same. So ANSI kind of, you know, gives us these guidelines for the test switch manufacturers to ensure that you guys don't have any problems where if you go out, you pull out that old switch that maybe the plating is starting to wear off, like Raphael said, you know, and you want to replace it with something new, it's not an issue. So long as you put something in with a similar configuration, because then you may have some wiring issues, right? Trying to run your wires to different space places. So, so layouts of test switches, one thing I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware of, especially some of you who may be new to transformer rated uh, metering in the field. You know, there are several different variations of how you can lay out a test switch. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we have, I would say, up to about 190 different configurations of test switch layouts. Um, why? Because some engineer at some utility decided, hey, nope, this is how our test switches must be. Okay, so the important thing is to remember is that there 
all the same. You may see different things, you know, a, you may see a seven pole switch or a four pole switch for different services or a 10 pole switch for 9S services or whatever it may be, but they are all doing the same job. And if you just stop for a second and think about it and take a good look at it, you'll see that they're all very similar. The two most common layouts that you will see is what I'm showing here, which has all your phases kind of grouped together. So here I have an A phase voltage, A phase current, B phase voltage, B phase current, C phase voltage, C phase current, and then my neutral. That's extremely typical. It's the same exact switch as what you see in this picture right here. The only difference is these handles are covered. They're not just red and black, okay? The other popular thing that we see, and it's probably about 50-50, is a layout like this, where I have all my voltages on one side and then all my currents on the other side. So I have A voltage, B voltage, C voltage, neutral, then my A phase current, B phase current, and C phase currents, okay? And they're always in pairs. Currents are always in pairs, remember, because you have the current return, okay? So that that current can come back and make that loop always. So those are going to be the primary two types that you guys will see out there, either voltages all stacked on one side or each, each section located by phase, like you're seeing in this picture here. One isn't any better than the other, it's just a matter of preference, but we see all kinds of crazy stuff too as well, where people take their you know, B phase jack switch and put the B next to the C phase return and it just stuff all over the place. And we just have these funky current links that we'll talk about in a second that link all this stuff together. And it really gets complex. And the problem is, you know, when you have something like that, you really need to give it some serious thought before you go making connections to it to make sure you're connecting to the right thing. Um, but typically that's what you'll see. You'll see all the voltages on one side and all the currents on one side, or you'll just see them grouped by phases. So it's not, you know, one isn't any better than the other. So if you, if you do, you know, go to another utility and you see it's different, it's just step back, take a look at it. You know, your voltage switches are just gonna be straight switches. There's not gonna be any jacks on there or anything. So that's how you can identify those. Um, but that's important to know. You will see different layouts. It's not untypical. The handle colors, um, you can see in this switch here, again, they just designate these handle colors to match the wiring color. You know, we're here, this is just red and black, these switches here. And that's pretty typical. It's probably for us 50-50 again, where we see just red and black handles versus colored handles. Um, the, you know, the thinking on the colored handle is, well, you know, I like my guys, we can just land those wires because those colored handles will now match the wires you know so i would have in this case i'd have an orange wire or a red a black they would just match those wires to the color of the handle so we know we're doing it right we can even have you know a handle half colors where i may have white with a blue half and black with a yellow half whatever it may be for you know wires with you know white wire with a blue trace or whatever it may be um but the other school of thought is just the black and red um, I kind of like that because, you know, the school of thought on if you just go with black and red, it really makes your guys think, or girls, when you are wiring up a box, you know, when you're wiring up a meter socket, if it's just red and black handles, you really have to think about every connection that you're making. Um, so I kind of like that. But for us, for the manufacturers, there's really not much of a cost difference to us. I mean, it may cost a little bit more for, you know, the colored handles, but by colored handles, maybe, but... For us, it's not a big deal for the test switch manufacturers. The other thing you may see, um, and this is important, is reversed versus normal potentials. And in this case, here, let me show you the voltages. So this guy, you can see your voltages typically swing down, right? So I open these up. Now, the problem with that is when I open this voltage up like this, these arms are hot. These legs on this switch are hot. And a 9S service, that could be 480 volts. So you wanna be really, really careful when you're doing that. So some utilities, and this has really seemed to take off more out west than it has on the East Coast, they've started to use reverse potentials where the potentials swing up. You can actually see it, I have an example of that on this switch here. You see how the handles are opposite of the current handle. So these actually swing up. Now the beauty of that is when I open up my voltage and if I'm working on my meter socket, now this is no longer energized, right? My my bar here, my test switch, it's no longer energized. So that makes it nice and, nice and safe. Now, the only downside to that is when it's open, it's not energized, but if your hinge starts to wear out on you, the thought is that that switch could swing itself back down under its own weight and reclose on you while you're in there, you know, doing something to the meter socket, right? So a lot of people don't like the reverse potentials, 
just because of that. So there's really two schools of thought. Some people love it. They love the safety aspect of it, but other people say, nah, it's, we don't like the idea that these could potentially close on themselves while my guy has his hand in the meter socket. Um, again, the other thing you'll see in here is something you guys probably typically don't see in your switches are these current links. They're in every single test switch you buy. It's just not something you see because they're buried, but this is what makes that current return possible. So when I open up this guy, this little L-shaped piece here in the test switch enables it to make that right turn back to the other switch. So when I open this up, I take the meter out of the equation and my CT loop just keeps going away from the meter, okay? And then base sizing, you'll see a couple of different size bases here. Um, you know, typically for us, we use 10 pole bases and four pole bases. So anything up to four poles, we do on a four pole base. Anything up to 10 poles, we do on a 10 pole base. There are some manufacturers that also use seven pole bases as well for seven pole switches. Um, some folks, I don't know if there's anybody on from Southern Cal Edison, they actually build their 10 pole switches on a 13 pole base because for them and their 480 services, they look, they want to spread the potentials out even further. So they like to make sure that there's a space between the potentials. Um, so you'll see all kinds of different things there with what people do as far as, um, you know, where it be the handles, the handle colors, the layout. Um, and then the last thing is the, the barriers on the test switches. The important things about the barriers is, you know, your barriers always go around the voltages. You really don't need the barriers around the currents. The, the concern is that you don't want any voltage leaking between, you know, your A phase or B phase or so on and so forth. So that's why we use barriers. We typically use barriers just around the voltage switches. Um, when we went for our UL recognition on our switch, they were really, really hot on making sure that the barrier came all the way out so that the um, voltage could not even, you know, make its way over to the next one. So I don't know if you can really tell here, but that barrier protrudes out further than the switch so that the voltage couldn't creep its way around. Um, that was actually a big deal for you well. Um, and then you'll also see, these are fixed barriers. We typically always use the fixed barriers. I like these better. They're also removable barriers you guys may have seen which is nice, you know, you're out there with your gloves and your leathers and, you know, you're trying to get your big fat thumb in there with all those gloves on protective equipment. You know, you can pop those barriers out and get to your switches. What I don't like about them is what if somebody forgets to put that barrier back or they put it back in the wrong location? Um, so me personally, I'm not a big fan of the removable barriers. I understand the appeal of it because you can, you know, pop them out to get them out of your way. But with fixed barriers, you're always safe. You don't have to worry about somebody not putting a barrier back into place. All right. And then last, I know we're probably going a little bit long here. Um, test plugs, again, ANSI defines the test plugs. Just one thing I want you guys to make sure you're being careful of on your test plugs is, you know, ANSI calls out the depth of this test jack here. And they also call out the length of your test plug. And it's really, really important that that is correct. There was a manufacturer who made some test equipment a few years back where the test jack, the test plug rather, was a little bit too long. And it was actually going in and grounding out on the bottom of the switch, causing a short. Um, obviously, as you can imagine, that's a big deal. So you want to check that. Take your, you know, test plugs off one of your pieces of test equipment, stick it into your switches. Make sure it's not bottoming out. Just another thing to, another precaution you can take. Um, also, there's these safety covers out there that we use just for when the switch is open. Tom was talking about using the covers just to make sure your switch is closed. But we have the safety cover we developed for a utility up in New England. Uh, a few years back, where they had a guy that was in the box, the test switch was open, and he was working on a meter socket, and he dropped the screw, and went to grab the screw, and it's just human nature, you know, something drops, you go to grab, and he got his arm on one of the potentials at a 480 volt service, he got hurt pretty bad, so it was a big concern for them, so they asked us to come up with something, so we have this cover, now that will go over your switches. And this is great. This just protects you if you drop a screwdriver or something, you know, you don't have to worry about anything arcing out across your voltages. Um, it's rubber, this thing, you know, it's, it's a vinyl, I believe is a material that lasts, you know, a long time there. You won't have any issues with this thing, but it's just, you know, if you have to leave a box with the switch open for some reason, or you're working on the socket, it's a nice piece of uh, safety equipment that you can have with you. Okay. So, and then lastly, just on your, you know, transformer rated enclosures, there are different cover types that you can get. Obviously, as you guys, I think all know, you know, you have you know, uh, single piece covers, two piece covers. You can get these with locking rings or just without locking rings. Um, the only thing I would say is, you know, we had some utilities recently who were doing an AMI deployment 
on their trans sockets and they found that when they went to put their trans socket covers back on their ringless type covers they didn't fit over the new meters so that we had to make them some new covers for you know some old services that they had out there you know it just didn't work anymore with these new meters so just something to be aware of if you are using the uh uh, ringless type covers, but we see quite a bit of those. Most people like those and saves you the money of having to use a ring. Um, and lastly, if you are buying pre-wired boxes, just take a good look, inspect them when you receive them, make sure all the wiring is tight, make sure everything is connected really good. Cause again, that will cause you metering problems. If, if you, you don't have good connections, it's going to build up excessive burden in your uh, CT loop there. So I think I'm a little bit long here. So I apologize, Tom, I probably taken a little bit of your time, but, um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or we can uh, save those till the end, I guess, Andy, if you want. I think we're good for now. We can turn it over to Tom if you're there, Tom. Okay. All right. Um, so the next part of the um, presentation should have come up. Next part of the presentation is that's odd. I don't know why that didn't come up there, Andy. I can open it for you if you want, Tom. I've got it. It just, hold on. Yeah, open it, open it up there, John. For some reason, I'm, it said it was sharing and it stopped. No problem. Let's see, share content. Yep, just let me know when you want to flip, although I've seen this presentation 100 times, so I can probably yeah. read it. <laughs> so the next part, we're, what we're going to talk about is we're going to continue through safety again. Um, uh, because what we're really looking for here is to try and keep, John, I don't think it's showing. Uh, I'm sharing. You see it, Andy? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. No, I don't see it. Fine. Yeah, that no, one just went away. Did you just try sharing again, Tom? No, hold on a second. Let me just. No, I'm locked up for some reason. I don't know why. All right. Do you want to try sharing again, John? Sure. Now I can see it. Can you see that, Tom? Yep. Slide 17. Yep. Nope. I got nothing. That's all right. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You want to wing it, Tom? <laughs> okay. So the, I can run with this too if you want to. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. So the idea with the uh, with the hot sockets is once again it's a safety related issue. Test switches. A test switch is really a safety related item. It allows you to safely go in, and you know, let's face it, we're interfacing directly with the um, with the service. Okay. So in interfacing directly to the service, there is some uh, it, it, there is some potential, literally. All right. Same thing on a hot socket. We've got a potentially dangerous situation. Um, so we're going to talk about you know what is a hot socket. It's not a new phenomenon. I, mean, I think just about every meter tech who's been out there for any number of years has had situations where they go to pull a meter, and once they pull that meter. The, the guts of the socket comes with them. There's melting on the back of the meter. You know, all of these things are hot sockets. Okay, that's that's exactly what they are. All right. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what we saw in the labs, uh, what causes a hot socket, how you protect against it, and how you investigate. All right. So, John, you want to flip? Yes, sir. Okay. So wh why do we know anything about um, hot sockets? Um, we know a little bit about hot sockets because we've been fortunate enough to be involved with a uh, variety of uh, deployments. Um, hold on a second. I've got my whole machine is just going down on me here. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Oh, well. Um, Life in a virtual world. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> Um, we've been fortunate uh, to be involved with a variety of different deployments, uh, and we also, and some of that is work that we've done in the field with our customers, and we've also done a lot of retirement testing on uh, meters that are coming out of the field. Here in the Northeast, there are still a number of utility commissions that require 100% retirement testing, and in one case, they did not give any dispensation for an AMI deployment. So we've seen a lot of uh, retired meters coming out of the field that may be 
30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, and even some that are 70 plus years old. Uh, and we've seen what hot sockets have done to uh, meters. It's not a large percentage of meters that this phenomenon um, uh, that this phenomenon occurs on, but it is uh, the longer that the socket is out there, the more likely the uh, uh, the potential for it to occur. All right. Okay. So, in searching for hot sockets, what are you looking for? Well. The meter and the socket are both going to show um, some damage. All right. You're going to see pitted or discolored meter blades. You're going to see melted plastic around one or more of the meter stabs. Okay. And I'll show you some pictures in a little bit. But you're also going to see the same sort of pitting and discoloration on the socket jaws. And you're going to start to see a loss of spring tension on the socket jaws. And it's that final one which is really causing the issue um, for us. Want to flip that, John? All right. Um, so, what are some co some uh, common causes of concern in a socket? You're pulling. You're you're looking at a residential socket. What are you looking for? All right. Um, well, you're looking for a sprung or a damaged jaw. Uh, if you look in the bottom right there, you can see that jaw is completely shot. Uh, you're also looking for loose wire terminations, okay? Um, you're looking for maybe somebody installed the meter incorrectly and the meter blade was besides the socket jaw, but not in the socket jaw. Um, you're looking for any worn uh, wire insulation. Okay, that could be grounding over to the mounting box. Also, if you notice that uh, socket that I showed in my example here, this is a real life socket. Somebody came on in an AMI deployment. They pulled out a class 200 amp uh, meter and they were putting in a class 200 amp meter. But if you look at that socket, that's only a 60 amp socket. All right, you see a lot of that out there. There's a lot of older sockets that may be 100 amp or 60 amp um services uh we are in the levitt we're very close to levittown pennsylvania uh those first uh developments that were built by uh by mr levitt there in pennsylvania and new york and there are still a lot of, a lot there are still a number of homes in these levittown developments that have the old 60 amp service still on them from the early 1950s so you figure those sockets now are 70 years old and they were never upgraded all right. So all of these things are concerns when you're going into a residential service and all of these things can cause a dangerous situation. The one we're going to focus on is the sprung and damaged jaw. Why? Because it's the one that actually causes the hot socket. It damages the meter and it leads to it can lead to very elevated temperatures. I'm not saying these other issues are not dangerous. They are also dangerous, but the sprung or damaged jaw is what we've seen to be the primary cause of the hot socket issues. All right, Chad. Um, you can see in these uh, particular pictures here, you can see how the plating is kind of cooked. All right, you see that discoloration on that uh, jaw there. Um, it also, the heat accelerates the oxidation on the wire lug. You can see that off, uh, you can see that as well. Tin melts at about 450 degrees. So that means that this socket, you can see the sprung jaws, that socket was getting up to something over 450 degrees. All right, on the next slide, you can kind of see a close up of the jaw being completely separated uh, with a large gap. All right, you can see that, that that creates a very poor connection for the meter but it also creates something else. And you can also see, if you look on the left-hand part, you can see up near the top on the right, you can see some pitting has occurred and there's actually buildup or an oxidation buildup there on the top of that, uh, top of that jaw. All right, so in slide 23, we're doing an AMI deployment. Great, we're replacing every single meter in our service. What is the worst thing that we can do to a socket jaw? Replace the meter. Every time we pull a meter in and out of a socket jaw, I weaken that jaw. Residential meter sockets are not intended for multiple insertions and removals. All right. 
There is a design to think on it, uh, and I'm gonna show you a graph in a couple more slides where you can see how the holding force goes down fairly rapidly um, on most uh, socket jaws. But basically, the more that you replace them, the more that you remove and replace the meter, the greater your likelihood of really completely wearing out or damaging that socket jaw, all right? Hey, hey Tom. Yep. Go and that slide with the spacing of the jaw, is it um, possible to measure that separation or is there a minimum separation before removing that socket? Sure, so there is anything, any socket jaw that has a gap that is anything greater, uh, that has a holding force of less than five pounds is potential damage. Other than that, what happens is once you get a holding force of zero, any sort of vibration, because there's another element that you need to create a hot socket, and the other element is a catalyst. The most common catalyst is vibration. As soon as you get vibration on a jaw that has no holding force, what happens is you start creating very small gaps. As that meter is vibrating, you're creating very small gaps between the socket jaw and the meter. That gap is where you get the micro arcing. Ironically, a really large gap, one that is so large that you can't even touch the other side of the meter blade by, by a visible amount, you know, maybe uh, a quarter of an inch, you're not as likely to get a micro arc because the distance is so great. It's gaps where you're one thousandths, two thousandths, five thousandths of an inch of a gap between the jaw and the blade. Those are the most dangerous. So if I spread that jaw enough so that I permanently have that, almost any vibration is going to start to induce uh, micro arcs, which is what's going to give you your hot socket. Okay. So one of the can, one of the dilemmas we have as an industry is that the in most utilities, and by most, I mean well over 99% of the utilities, the utility owns the meter and the residential homeowner owns the meter socket. They may not realize that they own the meter socket, but they do. There are some exceptions. There are a few utilities out there that still own both meter socket and meter, in which case they have an easier time of it. But for everybody else, now you have to explain to the customer that it's your socket that's creating the problem. Of course, the customer turns around and says, yes, but it was fine until you replaced my meter. And unfortunately, they have a point because it may have been fine and that next removal is what put that socket over the edge, okay? Um, so every time you do an AMI deployment, the incidence of hot sockets and meter fires is gonna increase just because you're doing every single meter and the act of replacing the meter actually weakens the jaws. So it is something that you have to be very aware of. All right, so we created in the lab a hot socket simulation fixture. Uh, and what we do is we create a variety of different um, uh, gaps and vibration setups, and we simulate what happens out in the field with kids running up and down a set of stairs in a frame construction, um, heavy trucks going by, uh, a dishwasher maybe in the spin in the spin cycle or a washing machine in the spin cycle. Um, all these things can actually induce the hot socket. And in fact, uh, John, I believe you have a video there. Um, you can uh, yep, I thought I was sharing it. Are you guys? Can you guys see that or no? Can you guys see the video? Uh, maybe yeah. I can't see anything, but that's yeah. Okay. You can see it a little bit. It's kind of <laughs> jumpy though. But you get the uh, okay. idea. You can see the smoke in the background, and, and you can see the, a little bit of a blue flame spark coming up in the yeah. back. The blue flame is what you do not want. That is catastrophic failure. <laughs> going to flame. So yeah, you don't really you don't really want that. And in fact, on the next slide there, you can kind of see. You guys have probably oh, seen. Goodness. You've probably seen this on uh, meter sockets. You see the the melting right around the stab of the uh, of the blade. You can see the pitting and the discoloration on the blade. And you can even see on the um, on those protective feet for the meter, you can see that even that part started to melt. So this meter, uh, if you see this meter come through your shop, absolutely positively guaranteed that if you go out to the homeowner where this meter came from, that socket that corresponds to that blade is shot. No doubt about it, 100%. Okay, so when you see this, you can use this to diagnose immediately that there's a problem out in the field. You may have found that somebody already took care of it and has already addressed it, 
or you may not. So if you see these kinds of meters coming back through, these are the places to start. All right, hey, so Tom, quick question yep. um, coming in here from uh, Ricky here. Um, how long, we were talking about the socket safety clip for like the bad jaw. Um, how long would a temporary clip, you know, be needed to close a bad jaw? Like, obviously it's not a be all end all fixed solution, but what, what would you suggest? I guess he's asking how long to keep sure. it in. Yep. So we create, we'll show in a few slides. There's a couple of tools that we have, um, that we have built in, uh, that or that built in. There's a couple of tools that we've developed over the, uh, the last seven, eight years. One of them is a, uh, socket safety clip. And what that socket safety clip is designed to do is designed to fit over, we believe somewhere in the 80 to 85% range of the um, residential meter sockets that are out there. And there are a wide variety of residential meter sockets out there that have been developed over the years by a, a whole long list of manufacturers. Um, but this clip fits on eh, 80, 85%, and it provides about 20 pounds of force. Why is that good? I mentioned earlier in the lab, we determined that five pounds of force and less is where I can start burning up meters. And in the lab, once I get to zero pounds of holding force, I can burn up any meter of any vintage, um, given enough time. Now, 20 pounds is good. We recommend that those clips not stay out in the field for more than a year. We did studies here in our lab, long-term studies. We know that they're good for at least a year. Um, under extreme temperature and under um, uh, exceptional load, 200 amps continuous, which nobody really has. But theoretically, the meter and the surface is rated for that. So we know that they're good for a year. We recommend that they are only temporary, only good up to a year, and that a year should give you enough time to replace the, so the service. In some jurisdictions, if you tell the customer, hey, you've got to replace that box, there's a safety issue, they go get a permit, that permit says on it, good for one year. People of residential and homeowners have made the excuse that, oh, I thought I was okay for a year because that's what my permit said. So we made sure that the socket safety clip was good for at least that length of time. Okay? John, you want to skip through the next one? Sure, you want you want to talk about six? Um, do, you want to, one, one, do you want this one or no? Uh, slide 26. I can't see your screen. I apologize. Got it. You're on expected and unexpected results. Yep. So hot sockets are exactly that. They're hot sockets. The meter was never the cause. So whatever meter you're buying, these guys make good meters. They never caused the hot socket. All right. Um, electromechanical meters withstood the hot sockets better than the solid state meters. Um, although that has changed now because every meter manufacturer in the last five years, well, actually more like eight years, has spent a lot of time making their meters, the new AMI meters, much more robust against the hot socket phenomenon so that it is less likely to go to catastrophic failure, open fire, okay? Um, so they are better, but still, they're only better at defending against this hot socket. They are not immune to it, that's for sure. We found the current played only a small role. We thought the current would pay a large, play a large role. It doesn't. And a relatively small amount of vibration can be the catalyst that, bring, that uh, creates that hot socket and you can set up a continuous micro arcing at times, okay? We also thought contact resistance would play a big part. Nope, you gotta have a gap. All right, the next one, let's see how quickly the temperature can rise in here. On the bottom, on the uh, on the x-axis there, that's seconds. So you're talking about a minute, two minute, three minute, four minute, five minute. And you can see within three and four minutes, you're jumping up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? If you look at the orange one, you see a drop and then a spike and then a drop again. What happened there is micro arcing is basically welding. So there's two things that can happen when, you, when the micro arcing begins. Thing number one is you create a fire, burn up the meter, burn up the meter socket, maybe burn up the, uh, the building that it's on. Um, the other thing is that you weld the meter to the socket jaw. Now, welding the meter to the socket jaw is not a best practice in our industry. But it, uh, it does create a very safe environment. You're never going to get micro arcing again. You're not going to have a hot socket. You're not going to create a fire. 
it's safe until, until the next poor meter tech goes in to replace that meter or change out that meter. Because that's when the whole meter socket comes out with the meter, creating a very unsafe condition. And that's why that has happened. So for any of you guys where that happened to, where you pulled a meter and everything came from the meter socket, it all started pulling with it. That's because this micro arcing had occurred and basically the meter blade welded to the meter socket. All right. Um, Next one, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these gap evaluation. What happens is as you create the micro arcing, you see the buildup in the right hand uh, picture. That is a carbon buildup and those rough spots are about five thousandths of an inch high. They create an automatic, they create an insulated gap between the socket and the blade. So one thing about hot sockets is it is a degrading process. Every time it occurs, it makes the situation worse. So the, get, the timing between instances goes down each time that one occurs and the duration of the micro arcing increases. So if you go back, if we go back a few slides, you would see three and four minutes. The first time it occurs, it may only occur for 20 or 30 seconds. Now it's occurring for a couple of minutes. All right, let's get down to the next one, John. Um, those gap, those small gaps are what's important. We'll just skip right through this, John. All right. You can see at this one again, you get the micro arcing and the melting. And again, that that pitting actually makes the uh, gap a little bit more um, prominent and a little bit more permanent. So the blade is never really firmly touching on the uh, the socket jaw anymore. Down. You can see in this particular um, one that we did in the lab, you've got a, uh, this particular one was a Landis and Gear meter. Um, they put some, Landis and Gear put new plastic on the back. They were one of the first ones to do that. Uh, you can see the, the date stamp on this. This meter got up to two th over 2000 degrees for over two hours. We did this in the lab. And while we destroyed the blade and even pitted it, and that demonstrates that, yeah, copper melts at about, oh, um, 2,000 degrees. That base plastic that they're using on the back of those AX uh, meters is really good. Um, and that plastic melted at about 1,800 uh, degrees. But you can see rather than all the plastic from the back of the meter being melted, only that hole right around there. And this meter continued to provide accurate energy readings through all two hours of this 2,000 degrees. It was very, very impressive. So again, the the manufacturers of the AMI meters today, they're making their meters much more robust. Uh, Landis was really in the forefront of that, but the other guys all have also very quickly, right after them, started making meters that are really much more robust. All right. So what do you need to create a hot socket? You need a loss of jaw tension, vibration, and just nominal load. You can't do it with no load. We have never been able to create a hot socket with just the load required to um, power up the meter, um, which is just a couple of milliamps. Um, however, anything more than that, and we could create a hot socket. All right. Um, again, just real quick, the arcing creates the heat and a relatively small vibration initiates the arcing and exposure to those elevated temperatures. It has a cumulative effect. All right. The next graph shows you a little bit about how the force um, degrade so quickly. The blue and the green, uh, what you can see is that a brand new socket, maybe up to like 60 pounds of force required to insert or remove. However, very quickly after half a dozen, you're down to around somewhere around 15 pounds of force. The orange and the red, we heated up brand new jaws to 700 degrees for about five minutes to see what the effect of heat on the jaws would be. Within two or three insertions, we are at absolute zero. So when I say that the effects are cumulative and they get worse, they are. You start heating that meter up, you get up to six and 700 degrees. The next time anybody changes out that meter, you've got no holding force at all on that meter socket, guaranteed. All right, so anytime you have a hot socket, it really degrades the service quite a bit. Now, that blue and green one, over time, will we go from 15 pounds down to five? The answer is yes. It depends on the meter on the socket manufacturer and how many times. 
But once upon a time in the not distant past, and in fact, many of our many utilities still have this practice. If I don't pay my bill, they come out, they pull my meter, they put boots on the meter, they put it back in. I pay the bill, they take the meter out, remove the boots, put the meter back. If this happens a number of times, all of a sudden I've got a socket that has 20, 30 or 40 removals and insertions. That's a dangerous socket. All right, who sees hot sockets? Generally, whoever is changing out the meter in an AMI deployment, a lot of times that's a third party. Um, a lot of utilities say, well, we see the most important ones, the transformer rated uh, services. We see those because we did those ourselves. That's true. But ironically, hot sockets are not an issue for transformer rated sockets, nor for lever bypass sockets. And the reason is those sockets are designed quite differently, much better, much more robust, much more expensive. Um, but they are not susceptible to hot sockets. This is a residential self-contained service type issue, because if you think about it, it's a pretty cheap design. It's some bent metal that provides the spring force. That's it. It's not a lever bypass. It's not your nice transformer rated socket. It's just the sprung metal. All right, head down to the next one. So what are you gonna check when you're out there? You want your third party inspector or your guys to check for gaps, discoloration, signs of, look at the back of the meter. If you look at the back of the meter and you see any signs of melting, you know you got a problem. You see pitting on the blade, you're probably gonna see it on the socket jaw. A loss of tension, check the condition of the wire insulation, check the overall box condition, look for signs of tampering. Just because people are thieves doesn't mean they're smart. We've seen some pretty dumb things. I'm sure all of you have seen a butter knife in, in a uh, set of jaws. That butter knife just deformed your jaws and created a problem. Uh, water, debris, animals, all those kinds of things that could create problems. Maybe not this problem, but another one. Shown in the picture there, we've got a hot socket gap indicator. That's just a spring jaw on a constant force spring that's set for about six to eight pounds. So if that, sprint, if that jaw does not go into the socket jaw, it means the socket has at least six to eight pounds of holding force if it slides in, it means I've got less than that. Now I've got a dangerous situation. There's also a socket safety clip. If you find a weakened jaw, you slip that over it, you come in from the front and then uh, turn it 90 degrees and that provides 20 pounds of holding force, all right? Um, one of the things that really causes, that can cause a hot socket, and I know none of you guys out there have ever done it, but occasionally a meter, a meter tech wants to get the meter in a little bit easier because for whatever reason, this brand new socket jaw is kind of tight. So he takes that big old screwdriver out of his back pocket or out of his case, throw, puts it in there and gives it a little, little turn just to kind of spread, those, spread that, spread that uh, jaw a little bit. And then sure enough, that meter goes in there a little bit easier. The problem is if you turn that a little too much, you could create a hot socket situation even in a brand new uh, socket. So please don't do that. Yeah, one point to that, Tom, if I could, that 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 jaw becomes plastically deformed at that point too, right? So okay. you're, you guys, oh, it's, it's got a gap. I'll just take my pliers and squeeze it back together. And, and it may look okay, but you may not have any spring force in there because you have it has been plastically deformed. Right, in fact, if you go to the next slide there, John, that's the, the second thing, you know, what can you do? What shouldn't you do? The easiest thing is replace the damaged jaw if you can. Never try and do what John just described. Never try and squeeze it together because metallurgically you haven't changed the properties of that jaw, all right? It's plastically deformed, as he said, so it has no holding force anymore, okay? Um, you can, if, if everything else looks good, you can replace the socket block, okay? And that would replace the upper and the lower jaw both at the same time. All right, now sometimes you don't have those parts or they're harder to come by. So again, part of what we've done is we created the hot socket gap indicator in the top left, the socket safety clip in the bottom left. We also have a hot socket repair kit in the right where we've retooled for a lot of manufacturers that are no longer in business like Anchor and things of this nature. You can still buy parts from manufacturers. We can provide them. When we when we provide a kit the first time to a utility, we try and provide some of everything, and pretty quickly they under they get to know what they have out in your particular service area, and they buy replacements of hey, give me twenty of these or forty of these, or fifty of these. Um, we also include all the tools that you might need, um, T seals, clips for the box, the hasps if you had to replace the hasp on the box. 
because the easiest thing to do is repair the box while you're out there. Otherwise, you've got to go chasing the customer to get it replaced, and no customer wants to hear about an unexpected $300, $400 bill that he's going to have to lay out um, to get an electrician to come in, and oh, you're not providing any service until he does that. It, it never goes over well, especially when they point out that everything was good until you went in there. All right, real quickly to try and wrap up. Um, John, I think we've already covered slide 39. Just jump over to 40. Um, so utilities are looking for alarms that they can uh, that they can look for. The meter manufacturers are looking for alarms that they can look for. And there's a variety of them that they've looked at. Temperature levels, uh, impedance levels, and we developed one just to look at RF, uh, RF emissions because that micro arcing creates an RF signature, all right? Um, so those are the three different ways that people have done it. There's one manufacturer now that is sensing the temperature at all four blades, which is really good because that's where the heat will build up. So that will work. Anytime you're, the other ways of doing temperature sensing are you're just sensing the temperature at the metrology board in the meter. And the problem there is you can have a 2000 degrees at the blade, but that metrology board is not sensing anything more than a couple of hundred. A 200 amp meter at full service in the worst conditions and the worst ambient condition can actually run at 140 degrees for an extended period of time, and that's Fahrenheit. Okay, so temperature sensing at the metrology board is not so great. Temperature sensing on all four blades works well. Impedance testing, people have tried that. It's not really worked very well because there's a lot of different reasons for the impedance to change in a meter circuit, corrosion, loose connections, etc. Um, so it, it may tell you about other issues, but not necessarily hot socket. Um, the other thing is to detect the RF signature. That's something that uh, Tesco has developed and uh, patented. And um, several of the meter manufacturers now are building it into their products. So you can ask them about that uh, as well. I know the ITRON guys and the Landis guys are now, uh, are now working with that. And the other manufacturers are testing it now. All right. Um, so, summarize, because I know I've kept you all about seven or eight minutes long, so I apologize for that. Um, the, so the hot socket starts with a loss of tension of one or more of the socket jaws. That's what it starts with. And it can start early on if you had a tight socket, and then somebody tried to open that jaw up, make it less tight, that could be a problem. Once you have that loss of tension, you can create micro-arcing. You do need a catalyst, and that is usually the vibration, all right? And the meter has to have some draw, but we've seen it with just a light bulb, a very small security light, some very nominal hundreds of amps worth of load, and that's all you really need, all right? So you don't even need an amp. And again, it's cumulative. Every time it occurs, that socket degrades a little bit more. Want to slide on to 33? All right. The meter manufacturers have been great. They have responded really well to this. And the meters you are buying in 2021 are far better than meters that were installed even just 10 years ago. All right. They're much better. Your older electromechanical meters that you might be replacing if you're just doing AMI now, those are actually in pretty good shape. They're not immune to it, but they are more resistant to it. They're about as resistant as the new AMI meters. All right. When you replace a uh, self-contained service. We do a thorough visual inspection. We make that hot socket gap indicator. We put that out there because it's kind of idiot proof. It's you see red or you don't see red. If that blade go, goes all the way in, there's no red. If it slides into the socket jaw instead, then you would see red. All right? Kind of like the uh, safety on a gun. See red, you're dead. So you don't want to see red on a hot socket gap indicator. Um, you inspect all your jaws. We do have clips. If you can repair the service, that's always the best thing. Subfacility, say no, that's not our policy. We can't do it. As you go into AMI, that tends to be something that is relieved. People are allowed to repair services. John, you want last slide there? If you want, if you got any questions, we can stay on for a few minutes. We do understand if everybody has, if people have to drop off because you do have a real job. Um, <laughs> So, and for next week, uh, last slide there, John, 
Uh, we've got meter testing in the field is coming up. Then we've got transformer rated testing using pickups and probes. And then we get into a whole bunch of field testing, analytics, shop testing. And then we talk a little bit more about AMI deployment and communication equipment as we wrap up the, uh, uh, the sessions. Andy, were there any other questions in the, uh, in the chat or should we let everybody get back to their real lives? <laughs> no, we have a couple questions coming in and we'll stay on if you guys take some time to type in your question and whatever. We're going to hang out a few minutes. Um, so go ahead and throw those in the chat. Um, we did get one from Steve here. It was mentioned earlier that using DOX might not be the way to go. Is there a better option? Uh, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I... Option, unfortunately, is nothing. Um, so yeah, if you can clean it up, uh, you know, when you're doing a transformer rated service, one of the things that you do is you tighten everything up and you clean everything up. And the same goes really for the self-contained. Deox is not a good way to go. Any kind of lubricant is not a good way to go. Um, you know, there, there are some lubricants that are, there's a few lubricants that are designed to be conductive. They're okay. Eventually lubricants will dry out in the field. So. They're a little bit of a problem. So yeah, the yeah, best option is not come that uh, the mess that it makes up your test equipment in your shop. Right. Yep, that's true, Jim. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and, and on a test switch, I mean, you get that crap on a barriers. Right now, you have conductive material on your barriers. Eh, not what you're looking for either. So. All right. All right. I don't know if anyone has any other questions. Um, Again, we'll stick around for a little bit. You want to throw them in the chat there. You can always listen to our session. I know a couple of people hopped off early. Um, they'll be put on our website, tescometering.com slash tesco dash Tuesdays. And um, we'll send that email out. If you guys are on our email list, you will get that as soon as it's ready to go. And um, other than that, if you guys have any other questions, comments, we'll stay on another few minutes. So yep. you're welcome there, James. Thanks for joining us. Everybody's quiet today. They're going to go get their donuts. <laughs> I'm still well, waiting for mine. <laughs> I, do, I do have the uh, I do have the chat back up. Um, okay. I saw JD mentioned something about this is the cause of some chatter in the field about smart meters burn down houses, and that's exactly right, JD. That's yeah. it's all about the smart meter. Oh, the new meter must be why my bill is up. The new meter must be why you know we had that fire. Unfortunately, the changing of a bad socket without catching that bad socket is going to create the problem and it looks very much like the smart meter caused it. The smart meter was a contributing factor because you changed out the meter in a bad service. Um, Saw that here in Philly. <laughs> Two houses burned yeah. down and <laughs> big bad utility <laughs> came up with that new meter in and burned everybody's house down. <laughs> Yep. It was a shame. It was awful. We still have 50, uh, 50 participants here, so it's Jim McGill here it's up in Canada again. I just wanted to tell the people that are still listening that a meter technician will never do anything more dangerous than pulling a meter off the side of a house, ever. Yeah. Why? Because there's no fusing all the way back to the transformers, mm. for starters. It doesn't have a switch in front of it to protect it. Yeah. So you've got to use all four senses when you're pulling a meter off. You have to look at that box for burning marks ahead of time use your smell because if, if it has heated up and you can you will be able to smell it a little bit use your ears when you start to pull that socket off you'll hear debris falling in the bottom of the base mm. if there's corrupted jaws in there and uh and use your feel because as you're pulling that meter off you'll feel that it's it's, a, it's not a nice smooth feeling anymore it's crunchy and uh, so use all four senses when you're uh, pulling a meter try and stay alive good point sir that's really that's that that's a really good point, Jim, because there is no fusing, there is no switch, it's all hot sequence there. Um it, it can be very dangerous. Um, very dangerous. The other thing is never stand in and I know all you guys know this, don't stand in front of the meter. The meter can it literally explode out of that socket. It is possible. Um, I've never seen it happen in person for me. Um, but I've certainly seen videos of it. Uh, it's not hard to create those situations uh, in a lab, at least, but it, it'll really hurt you. So don't stand in front of the meter. You're always off to the side. I know it's easier if you stand in front, but don't do it. I've seen it a bunch of times, Tom, and I'll tell you what, the fireball that comes out of there is something you won't forget the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And meter, meter pullers are a wonderful thing. Some utilities believe in them, some don't. 
it's called a meter puller for a reason. You don't ever use one to put a meter back in because you lose control of that round meter as you're trying to push it back into the same, the jaws in the same place. And it robs you of that feel sensation that I was just talking about. So anyway, meter pullers are a wonderful thing, but it's up to each utility whether they want to use one or not. Yeah. Anyway, that's it for today. And yes, Rivera, please don't wiggle the meter with your screwdriver. Don't do that. <laughs> and yet, uh, somebody else said that they asked the homeowner to open their house breaker before we disconnect or change out a meter. Yeah, that's that's good, but again, it doesn't help you back to the service. It doesn't help you back to your uh, uh, up to your pole. But yes, we do ask them to change, to uh, open the breaker as a best practice. Yep. All right, guys. Thank you all very, very much for staying on so long. Um, sorry that we ran over. We had a lot we were trying to put in. We are still hopeful that we're all going to get back into the real world at some point. So we have we are still uh, scheduling our users group if anybody is interested. Um, but of course, we'll see what the world has uh, in store for all of us. And if that's uh, if that's something that people can travel for in July, we can only hope. All right. Thank you all. And we'll talk to you next week about meter testing in the field. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tom, John, Jim, for chiming in there. And uh, we'll see you all next Tuesday. Take care. Thanks, everyone. See you. Bye.